Malachi chapter 3 is our landing spot today. We'll be starting out with chapter 2, verse 17 to kind of set the stage for it. But this, uh, this chapter is a great, uh, one of, a great messianic prophecy, one of the many, many messianic prophecies that we found throughout the minor prophets. And a uh, very important one, uh, chapters 3 and 4, are really God's last words to Israel for 400 years until Jesus comes and uh, until John the Baptist comes before him. So this is God's last word to Israel. Notice in verse 17 when this starts, uh, God is basically saying at this point that he's been worn out. Um, he says, you have wearied me, you have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, how have we wearied him? In that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in, t in them. Or where is the God of justice? So God's worn out in the sense of, uh, not that he's tired, uh, but that the time for putting up with perversion of justice is about to draw to a close. As that draws to a close, if that comes to a finish, uh, the following verses tell us that basically five things are going to happen here in verses 1 through six. Uh, number one, we see in verse one, chapter three, God's messenger is going to come and the Lord himself will then arrive. Look at the uh, uh, verse itself. He says, behold, I, he's talking about himself, the Lord here, I am going to send my messenger and he will clear the way before me. So this is God that's going to be coming. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So I think there's a hint of the Trinity here. I don't think it would be going too far uh, in terms of reading the Old New Testament into the Old Testament, but certainly a hint of Trinity there that uh, I am going to send my messenger and I am going to come and you'll see the Lord of hosts. So the first thing that happens is God's messenger will come and then the Lord himself will arrive. This is how he's going to address this injustice. Verses 2 and 3 uh, is a testimony, uh, a promise that Israel is going to be purged. Uh, when we talk about purge, think of a, a gold refiner, uh, boiling gold in a hot um, cauldron, separating the pure gold from the rock that it's mixed with, or silver is the same way, being purified in the same way. This is how Israel is going to be purified. We know we saw this same thing in the book of Zechariah in Zechariah 13, 8. The Lord said there that two-thirds of Israel would be purged and a faithful third would remain. So the third thing that happens is in verse 4. It says acceptable worship at that point will be offered to the Lord. I, I think this is a reference actually to Matthew 23, 39. I don't think it's too much of a stretch to, to say that. In Matthew 23, 39, uh, the Lord sa tells uh, Israel that he will return when they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's going to be uh, not the uh, condition of a rapture. The rapture of the church can happen at any time. But the uh, return of the Lord, his second advent to Israel, is dependent on Israel turning to him with um, sincere desire for him to return. And I think that's the acceptable worship that's being referenced here in verse 4. Verse 5, we see uh, a final denunciation. It says, uh, I'll draw to you for judgment and I will bring be a swift witness against the sorcerers and so on. Uh, final denunciation of the ungodly of the nation. God himself is going to stand up. God himself is going to accuse them. Uh, perhaps talking about the uh, judgment of the sheep and goats at the end of chapter 25 of Matthew, where the Lord is separating the uh, nations and uh, separating the believers from the unbelievers in Israel itself. So we'll see a final denunciation there. And then finally in verse 6, uh, a, a godly remnant. Uh, again, Zechariah 13.8 talks about a third of Israel. A godly remnant will be preserved. Why is that? Is that because Israel's so strong? Is that because they're so faithful? Uh, obviously not. <laughs> they're going to be preserved because God is faithful. He doesn't change. 
and he, they, his people will not be consumed because he's made promises to them that he will never, ever go back on. We come to chapter, or verse 7 in this chapter then, and we see that it's uh, really an admonition here to return to the Lord. I want to point out, too, a, a theme we see, and sometimes people say, you know, the Old Testament was full of law and the New Testament is full of grace. Well, look at the grace here in verse 7. The grace and mercy of God. There's, there's century upon century of Israel turning aside and what does he do? He invites them back. Return to me and I will return to you. Uh, and he gives them not only, um, uh, gives them clear instruction, I guess. It's not obscure. It's not a mystery on how to return to the Lord. It's basically return to his word. Look at verses 8 and 9. It says, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? The Lord replies, in tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. So basically what he's telling them here is they need to confess their covenant violations. Uh, again, we're looking back on the book of Deuteronomy. He's telling them, obey my word. That's what we can say here. Obey my law. That's how you will turn, return to me. Um, I think that the, uh, they were literally withholding their tithes, literally returning their offerings. But I think also these literal things are um, kind of a figure of speech. Sometimes we run into it called a part for the whole. So when we speak, for example, of the White House says and the White House does this and that, it's speaking for the United States, the part, the White House, is for the whole, the United States. I think in this case, the tithes and offerings is part of the law, but what's represented here is the whole law. They've abandoned not only those tithes and offerings, but they've, they've abandoned the whole law, and he's calling them to return. And look in verse 10. Again, just the graciousness of God. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there will be food in my house. Now test me in this. He offers himself to be tested. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven. He's basically saying if you obey the law, as I said in the book of Deuteronomy, I'm going to pour out on you the blessings that Deuteronomy entails. Deuteronomy 28, the verse 15 verses of that chapter, just as blessing after blessing. And he is again offering them to immediately turn and be, uh, find blessing and protection if they would only repent. So what a, what a great offering here uh, that God is making to them. Verse 13, another dispute. Uh, your words have been arrogant against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? And then he tells them, you have said it's vain to serve God. And so on here. The slander that they're perpetrating against the Lord is they're saying that it's useless and no benefit to obey God's word. Uh, in this case, again, uh, specifically, the prophets are talking about the book of Deuteronomy. And they wrongly say that those who do wrong are blessed and established, and, or what he says built up in verse 15 there. And I, I think in some sense, verses 7 and 15 kind of form bookends. In both of those verses, they are misrepresenting God, misrepresenting what he said, and misrepresenting his word. And um, uh, I think that uh, God, they've just given us these bookends here to show us, uh, to focus us on the misrepresentation, the apostasy that's really fallen into them, that's, that Israel's fallen into. Verses 16 to 18 end on a more hopeful note, uh, especially maybe perhaps for some of you who are um, faithful and perseverant in God's word and among God's people, and you wonder, um, is there any benefit for this? Is there any payback? Am I going to be rewarded? Uh, I'm putting up with so much. Uh, is there any future for me? So you're the remnant. You're the faithful remnant. And in verses 16 to 18, we see that remnant in Israel. They're hearing what the Lord says and watching what he does, just as you do. 
and he turns and watches over them. So immediately he is, they are watching and they are hearing and he is watching and he is hearing. So the Lord knows what you're doing. He sees you. I'd encourage you to go look and, for example, Revelation chapters 2 and 3. The Lord knows what's going on in his church. He makes a distinction between the faithful and the unfaithful. He makes a promise that the faithful will be clothed in white robes and reign with him forever and ever. So be assured, I think, that the book of uh, Malachi here in chapter 3, as well as the rest of the Bible, says that no act of unfaithfulness is going to go unpunished and no act of faithfulness will be unrewarded. So we need to be more than nice people in the church, that is more than people just getting along and compromising to just get along and not be a disruptive force. But we need to be good people, people who are committed to doing good and faithfully representing God and his word among God's people. God will see that, and brothers and sisters, God will honor that. Don't be discouraged and disheartened. God bless you.